Okay, I think we can start. So, hello everyone and welcome to panel six of Odyssey Chinese Cinema Season. Odyssey is the biggest Chinese film festival in Europe with in-person screenings in London and Edinburgh and more than 60 films available online until the 10th of June. As part of Odyssey, we're hosting 10 discussion panels with Q&A. And in this panel, we're going to talk about how to best deliver messages on environmental sustainability in films and animation. My name is Julia and I'm a PhD candidate at the Lao China Institute, King's College London, and an affiliate of the UK China Film Collab. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our amazing cohort of speakers today. Karma Wang Di from Television for the Environment, Linda Wong from China's Biodiversity Conservation and Green, Green Development Foundation, Yevgenia Golubeva, award-winning animation director and creator, and Ida Maria Olva, award-winning film director, musician, and beekeeper from Finland. We will have a chance to see some clips from Yevgenia's and Eva Maria's fascinating but very different approaches in delivering messages of global sustainability in their arts, and they will talk us through their projects. And so during the panel, feel free to pop in your questions in the chat because we will have some time for Q&A. And in alternative, you can raise your hands and speak during the Q&A session or um, just send them to me and I can read them directly to the panelists. So I would like to start with Ida Maria, who is the director of Summer of Bees, an award-winning short film about the importance of preserving biodiversity and saving the bees, which was shown in several film festivals, including the London Short Film Festival 2021, where I was lucky enough to see it, and the International Wildlife Film Festival. Now we will see a short clip from uh, Summer of Bees, and following that, she will talk us through the project behind it. So I will now share my screen. Just a second. Let me know if you can feel the, if you can hear the audio. There is no sound. Okay, sorry about that. Just one second. Laitan tänne, että hunajaprojekti alkaa. Milloin me ruvetaan sitä hunajaa saamaan? No, jos tää on yhtä kuiva kuin viime kesä, niin ei välttämättä edes tuu hunajaa. Mut sä oot laittanut tähän mitä 400 euroa säästöjä per pesä. Kyllä siinä saa muutama hunajapurke myydä. Opintolainaa. 
No ei mulla mitään säästöjä. Siis oot sä laittanut tuhansia euroja opintolainaan mehiläisiin? Joo. Okay, thank you. So, <laughs> Ida Maria, would you like to tell us more about this project, the work behind it, and yeah, just off to you. Yes, thank you, Julia. So yes, yeah, Summer of Bees is my latest short film. It's my graduation work from uh, Aalto University in Helsinki. And uh, the story is about beginning beekeeping uh, and climate anxiety. And it's based on my own experiences as a beekeeper uh, and everything that happens in the film has happened to me with bees. Uh, and I also keep bees with my mom. So there's also this aspect. Um, yeah, we really wanted to make a film about the generational gap when it comes to climate change and climate anxiety, because uh, it seems to be a big one and it's hard for uh, older generations to understand how us younger generations feel and we don't really feel like we have a future. And I started keeping bees myself to help with the pollinator decline and support the ecosystems around uh, the area, uh, just like the protagonist in this film. And yeah, it's really, it's something I really, uh, the topic of climate change and feeling futureless is really something that is reoccurring in my works, in my music and, and my films. And I, yeah, and we made the production as a green, as green as we could. We tried to make it a green production. We got this one, ecologically well done award also for the film uh, this spring and um, maybe we can talk about it later or now but uh, Finland has this new sort of ecological code for filmmakers to make ecological films so yeah <laughs> Thank you so much. I think that's really fascinating. And when I saw it, I could feel the anxiety with uh, through the film. So I, um, yeah, thank you so much for. And I did imagine that there was some autobiographical um, reality behind it, but not. I did not wasn't sure of what was the level and how autobiographical it actually was. So thank you so much. Um, let's move on to our next speaker, Evgenia. Uh, Evgenia Golubeva is an award-winning animation creator specialized in creating content for children. She's worked with many international high-profile clients, including Disney, Nick Jr. and Sky. And she's the writer of Obki, a risky animation production for Sky Kids about an alien on a mission to save planet Earth. And I will now show um, a, little, a short clip from Opki, and then Evgenia will talk us uh, through the project as well. Hello. Obki, ready for your next mission? Join Obki on his quest to help save the planet. Discover how small changes. What have we left on? Make a big difference. Oh, great idea. You can use both sides to help protect the environment. Let's find something grown locally. I'm fine. Obki, all episodes available now on Sky Kids. Yeah, uh, that was Obki. So, Evgenia, please, if you want to tell us more about that, I, I'm absolutely in love with this project. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Evgenia, and I was a writer on this lovely project, um, which was created for Sky Kids uh, together with Sky Zero. Uh, Sky, uh, Sky is trying to, by 2030, to be carbon neutral. So, they launched Sky Zero. 
and they commissioned the show that uh, I was involved since the very beginning. And uh, we already work on the second season as well. It's basically 15 episodes of two minutes. Uh, it's kind of comedy, like um, comedy about environment. <laughs> Obviously, environmental topic is quite upsetting for many of us. And I guess as a grown up, you, we all understand how tricky, you know, what a tricky situation we're in and actually, we need to do our actions quite fast and we need to change things quite fast. But obviously talking to kids, you can't just go and say how things are. So um, our uh, aim, main goal was to create project that actually creates also positive vibe about the whole thing and making kids feel that they get, can actually do something. Uh, and uh, for us, it was important to make sure that the messages are very simple. Every episode is only two minutes long. So uh, we would pick like microplastic in clothes, for example, because it turns out not many kids know that like uh, polyester is not great for the environment, not only because it's made from plastic fibers, but also when you wash it, it releases microplastic in the ocean and stuff like this. And we would uh, condense it and make a message very simple and something that kids can do at home or something they can talk to the parents as well about so they can influence the, the parents' decisions. Because obviously, because of, you know, like um, Ida, you were saying about the, um, the problem with different generations kind of taking different um, lessons differently and kind of not quite being open about certain things. I think it's important that kids start learning about it early on and they can also feel empowered that they can do something about it at this point and some messages uh, are just for awareness we talk about seagrass or we talk about greenwashing so kids are aware that was going on as well so then don't like it's not always call for action sometimes it's more about being aware of certain subjects and and i guess for us positivity and comedy was another tool that we thought that would help kids to just engage quicker so they see silly opki opki himself he is not the perfect character you know he's not like a eco warrior who knows how to do things he's actually quite silly and he does lots of things wrong at first but then after orb is like a little robot creature that hovers around helps him and they work as a team so orb is a bit knows all the information and helps opki to find the ways uh, how to save the environment in a simple action thank you so much for introducing us to opki uh, we're going to have a chance to talk through the projects more in depth um, later. Uh, I will now move on to our next speaker, Linda Wong, who is Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation that was find, founded in 1985 and is a leading environmental NGO and National Scientific Association, member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature and partner to the Convention on Migratory Species. Um, so Linda, would you like to talk us through the work of CBC GDF and what it does. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can I share my uh, my screen? screen? Yes. Let me oh. see. Okay. Got it. So I have uh, five minutes <laughs> uh, today. Uh, thank you so much for the UK China film uh, to invite me um, to this very precious opportunity to learn and to share. Uh, I'm uh, from uh, the China Biodiversity Conservation and the Green Development Foundation. And uh, this foundation actually, it is, um, uh, it witnessed uh, the UK-China friendship on conservation uh, in, uh, in 1985. As you see in the left picture, of course, it is kind of a cartoon. Uh, uh, it, the Milo deer, uh, is a kind of uh, endangered species, uh, but uh, it went into extinction in China about 100 years ago. And uh, the Duke of Bedford kept some of them. And uh, in the year of 80, uh, 1985, he kindly sent uh, the uh, about 18 middle years back to China. And that's why uh, the, we, uh, the China Middle Deer Foundation uh, has been established. And uh, later, after the United Nations signed uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the foundation renamed it to what you see uh, quite long, CBCGDF. And uh, we, um, uh, 
uh, we are Beijing based and uh, we are a native uh, leading Chinese uh, biodiversity organization and a leading one um, uh, in China and uh, also towards the world. So our core, core work uh, work areas uh, is sustainability, what fits today's theme very well. Uh, I will show you some, um, some slides about uh, our past experiences. Uh, this one was the ancient uh, young village. Last year, we uh, nominated this, uh, uh, this short movie to the TVE, uh, TVE's uh, GSFA. Uh, and uh, we are very happy that uh, it uh, performed very well. And uh, we, we are looking forward to uh, have more films from China to, uh, to let the world know what's going on in China and, uh, uh, and uh, what's the achievements, what's the problems and uh, what's the future together we can uh, make efforts to. Uh, this uh, is another one uh, called Born in China. Uh, on, uh, this movie was, uh, uh, um, was in 2016. Uh, it uh, told the story about uh, three species, including the giant panda and uh, the leopard and the monkey. Uh, so it, 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 it shows people uh, the wildlife and uh, our connection with them uh, in a very holistic way. And uh, we worked together with the production team and uh, uh, we, uh, the, the uh, box office in the uh, premiere, uh, they, gave, they donate a very small, a, a very small part like a one RMB to uh, the undertaking of uh, biodiversity conservation. So this is a very good mode for uh, films to uh, films on sustainability to work together uh, and to make a contribution for the world's sustainability. And uh, the next one, uh, as this one is returning to lakes. Uh, this one actually, it is not. Uh, it is not. Um, uh, a very formal one. Uh, this one was shot by our biodiversity conservation uh, in our neighborhoods expert team. They, because we were uh, working uh, for years on, on tracking some wetlands and uh, analyze its uh, uh, ecological, uh, ec ecological influences uh, uh, also over the past years and uh, we, uh, gathered a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, materials. Uh, so this one was cut into a short film, about seven minutes, and uh, we published it on our uh, on our website. Um, and uh, it also uh, reminds us about what persons can do, uh, can make production themselves, uh, like. Um, uh, I mean, uh, it has a potential like uh, our great octopus teacher. Of course, we needed more efforts, but uh, we, are, uh, we are working hard. The next one is about, uh, is about uh, uh, photography ethics. As you can see in the top picture, it looks beautiful, but uh, the reality is, is the, uh, you can see the truth is that uh, the snail uh, was uh, stabilized using a nail onto the tree. And it is kind of uh, fake, fake photography. Uh, so we, that's why uh, we, we have experienced a lot of uh, cases like this, uh, uh, mainly because uh, volunteers or general public, uh, general public, they called us and uh, 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 taught us about uh, these examples. That's why uh, we worked on a national uh, standard called uh, 
uh, Code of Ethics for Nature Photography. And uh, we are very happy to see that more and more people are aware of the consequence of uh, their photography behavior and, uh, the, and to show love and care to our nature. So this is a brief introduction first, and uh, I'm looking forward for more discussion uh, later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. That was really fascinating. And it's great to see the work that CBC GDF is doing to enhance awareness uh, on this topic and on wildlife conservation. Um, Karma, I would like now to introduce you to our audience. Um, you are the head of operations at Tele Television for the Environment, a UK registered charity founded by United Nations Environmental Programme, uh, WWF UK and Central Television in 1984. And its mission is to use uh, the power of storytelling to drive real world change for a more sustainable future, keeping the crucial new and sustainable development goals in mind. So would you like to introduce us the work of TVE? Thank you. Um, thanks, Julia. Um, hello, everybody. Um, before I begin, I'd like to show a quick promotion film about you know, it, it, it sort of encapsulates uh, everything that we do. So I'll play that out and then I'll just give a brief introduction about the, some of the things we're doing in the last couple of years. Okay. Weather patterns become unpredictable. Sea levels rise, forcing coastal villagers from their farmlands and into crowded inner cities. In the heart of Africa, there are four million people who are there and who need help. The doctors see their patient dying because they don't have something just to save their lives. 250 elephants that were killed for their ivory for that one shipment. We don't yet know really how long it will take plastics to degrade in the environment. We have now entered a whole new geological epoch. There's clearly no dispute that climate change is happening, and there's no better indicator to illustrate this than glaciers. Or the legal system is uh, actually engaged in um, justifying all these human rights violations. Refugee camps were destroyed and whole families wiped out. Um, that's uh, sort of in our um, just encapsulates what we do in the last uh, and as Trida said that uh, TV was formed uh, over 37 years back in 1984 and it was under the United Nations Development Program and WWF UK the initiative was at that time when uh, it wasn't it wasn't trendy to talk about environment in our television screens and in our you know in our in our debate about our you know in our film debate so in in those initial years, the founders thought that um, that you know there has to be a you know concerted effort about you know getting more of these stories out to the world. So, TVE uh, began as a non-profit organization. Uh, purely uh, initially was to uh, as a production agency which produced films for um, uh, for large organizations like BBC and and WWF and big bodies. 
Um, it then went on to start commissioning films also from there. This, they had a certain uh, uh, funding projects where they started commissioning films out again, keeping uh, some of the structures within the UN sustainability development goals in mind. These, these films were uh, produced with partners across the world. Um, that happened for, uh, till about the early 2000. But since 2000, because of the way the structure of producing films and also content around the world has dramatically changed with the advent of the internet, uh, TV has gone more into advocacy as well now, and advocacy primarily dealing with uh, the the young, uh, the youth, the youth generation. So um, in the last ten years, TV has moved not just from producing films but also trying to engage young people in trying to uh, uh, create the right kind of content from them, and also look at solutions in some of these issues that we are tackling. Uh, what TV really believes is that. Uh, the larger issues or the environmental issues that we're facing can cannot be tackled by much uh, large, larger governmental organizations or companies, that, uh, but also has to be come from a concerted effort from young people as well. And uh, these young people can give you solutions in the local areas, and then these can be you know incorporated into larger models across the world. And so what we have been trying to do is to highlight some of these solutions and ideas from young people as well in the last 10 years. Um, apart from that, we also try and highlight a lot of films uh, which target, which also look at these issues in the climate debate in the last uh, 10, 12 years. And then so we have an annual awards called the Global Sustainability Film Awards, which is held annually at the BAFTA Hall uh, in November. And there we try and target and highlight, you know, uh, interesting films right from individuals to uh, uh, corporate houses to organizations as well. So, um, in a nutshell, this is what we've been doing, and uh, I can talk to you about some of the other projects which we're doing later in the conversation. Thank you so much, Karma, for introducing us to the work of TV. I think it's really important that the awareness that there is an organization that is aware of the importance of storytelling and uh, of sustainability storytelling and how that can really make a change. and encouraging this to keep happening and involving younger generations. That's really important. Um, I would like now to move a bit deeper into discussion. And I wanted to ask uh, Ida um, about the theme that you mentioned of eco-anxiety that you said is a recurring theme um, in your films, in your creation. Um, and yeah, that what I really appreciate about your film is that you're not trying to force a cute vision of nature, something that is positive or optimistic, uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing something about it, even if it's hard. Um, so I wanted to ask a bit more about the concept of eco-anxiety um, and also who do you think your primary audience is um, and what is the message you're trying to share with them? Thank you. Yes, thank you. So our audience basically was uh, young people with eco anxiety and then their parents who don't understand <laughs> or like, and I think we really reached uh, like this really well. I think the, the mother child relationship with this generational gap about climate really like has found the audience and like older generations and I think they like that was my like what I wanted to like it's very easy because I've been suffering a lot from climate anxiety for the past I don't know <laughs> 10 years or something and and it's really hard to make like a positive film about it because all you want to do is like tell your parents like we do like that <laughs> they have ruined everything but that's not a very good way to open up a discussion <laughs> so I really wanted to uh, make a film with some like warmth and humor and I wanted this young uh, person with climate anxiety to be also like a bit paradoxical and like not perfect because nobody's perfect when it comes to like so yeah um and i really just wanted to like make it known to explain how it feels to live with the feeling like you don't have a future but not in a preachy way <laughs> but i think we like managed to do it and i think yeah it's been really good 
Yeah, I think it's really great at delivering that message. And it's really hard, as you all like differently mentioned, the uh, the importance of speaking to the to different generations and like adopting the right approach to speak to different generations. So I would like to start from there to ask Evgenia what yeah you were mentioning about the importance of having an optimistic approach when we want to introduce new generations to this problem because we don't want to make them believe there is nothing to do to to begin with. So yeah, um, I guess what's the importance of optimism and for our children's? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's uh, important also because um, the reality is uh, our life's current lifestyle is not very sustainable and uh, this planet can't sustain the current lifestyle we have. And I guess it's about making sure that new generation knows about pitfalls and knows about problems and knows so they kind of grow up with the idea that actually it's not endless supply of things it's it's and it's kind of introducing idea that every choice you make in life uh, actually affects something else somewhere else so you buy a t-shirt and it's important to just check where is it made was it made off so it's, it's like it's, it's just about also making sure that they're conscious about their choices and choices that their parents make we're kind of hoping that by informing kids kids will go then to parents say hey like what about our uh, supplier is our electricity supplier green or things like this, or if the children in charity, they're going to donate money to, maybe it could be charity that is making something to do about seagrass. And, and, and sometimes, um, so I guess it's important to keep it positive and keep it actionable because uh, I suffer from climate anxiety myself. And when I read new scientists and I read the like latest reports, it's, it's very upsetting. And I, I don't want to pass it on to the next generation because they're going to inherit it. They, they need to make, they need to do something. They need to actually feel empowered to do so. And I think uh, comedy, uh, it's a great way of actually introducing these ideas without going into darker side and obviously they can research and find things later for themselves as well uh, but but this is why the messages need to be clear for kids need to be entertaining need to be in small bites so it's just two minutes so they can learn something quickly and uh, hopefully eventually actually implement it in their everyday life as well without being preachy to their parents either so it's more about that. it's hopefully families watch it together you know and they can learn all of them can learn something from it <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think comedy is a great, uh, great way to introduce this topic and without starting a fight, which is not always easy uh, when talking to like our parents' generation, but also to introduce the topic to, to newer generations. And speaking about the importance of, um, um, of increasing awareness with children, uh, Karma, I know that TV works with schools and children and um, there is a project specifically you're working on um, regarding that. Would you like to uh, talk, tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so for the last 11 years, TV has been running a project called the Bio Movies Project. What would, under the Bio Movies Project, what we did was we were targeting mainly children, not children and also uh, young people between the age group of 16 to uh, 28, 29 year olds, where Every year, we would have had a specific target in terms of you know, some of the UNSDG targets, you know, some of the uh, topics within that. So, for example, uh, receding sea levels or poverty or, you know, right to food or right to, you know, right to um, uh, water. So these kind of issues, we would throw it out to the, you know, the, the kind of network of children, the young people we had across the world. So uh, under the Biobuies project, we have a network of around 7,000 young people um, right from the global south to North America to you know the, the European region, where these people are, they are they are uh, filmmakers, climate scientists, um, doctors, engineers, so from, but from who are who are you know interested in the idea of sustainability and climate issues, and so we throw these topics to them and then ask them to make a film you know under three minutes, and then. Um, Films which are targeted primarily for solutions, you know, in terms of some of the things that we are we are trying to throw to them. And then, what we've noticed is that very very interesting positive ideas have come out of these in the last eleven years. And some of these solutions, what uh, we have then tied them tied these solutions down to corporate companies and also different organizations, and they have incorporated some of these ideas. So 
these are micro steps, but we think that you know this is the way where we can connect with you know young people and also the you know the policymakers at the other end. So seeing that, what we saw is that in the last, what we noticed that in in the last four to five years is that there is a lot more uh, focus um, being targeted even younger people who are you know very very concerned about you know these issues that exist. So this year, what we have started is another project which we are starting piloting with schools in the UK. Um, this is again now. This is going even younger now. We're going on the primary level. So starting right from you know, Evgenia might be you know you might might be happy to hear this, but it's starting from around six to seven year olds and going all the way to fourteen year old, fourteen fifteen year olds, where again we are taking some of our archival work to e schools, um, breaking it down to bite size so that it's easy for them to digest. So among the content that TV has produced in the last 37 years, we have around 12,000 short form, long form, you know, uh, documentaries and films that we made. So we brought them down to bite-sized formats, you know, two minutes, three minute films, uh, some of them even animation, you know, so, so, so we're taking these through these primary kits where they can understand some of these issues that we are facing. And then what we will also do is then take uh, you know a batch of filmmakers with us. So you know it'd be really great if somebody like Eugenia can also join us for this, some of these projects where we are taking some BAFTA winning filmmakers. We have tied up with um, you know um, academy winning film uh, organizations like Spring Films. Um, we'll be taking the filmmakers through these schools, interacting uh, interacting with these children, and then and trying to understand from their perspective what they feel about these films that they've seen. And then ask them to create a content on what they what what are the solutions that they could think about in their local areas. And then, if there are interesting things which come out from these young people or ideas which come out, we will try and highlight these ideas at our annual BAFTA at the Global Sustainable Film Awards at BAFTA. So, I think you know this this Ida also mentioned that there is a big uh, gap in terms of how the young and the old think in this in the climate debate. And I, the only way what TV, I think what we have seen is that the, the only way we, we can, you know, bridge this gap is through content. Everybody is consuming content these days and mainly primarily video content and bite-sized video content. And if you can break this down into bite-sized content and coming from young people, I, we believe that, you know, this can really sort of, you know, bridge the gap and also, you know, help about, you know, getting people more, really more, I mean, People are aware about the issues, but they don't have an, they don't know about to go about it, except for recycling a bit here and doing, you know, saving a bit of electricity. But there are a lot of other things around the, the climate debate. So what we want to do is to get these solutions to these people on a bite-sized format, which they can digest easily. Yeah, thank you. That's really important uh, to yeah to create and initiate dialogue. Uh, and to see what we can actually do apart from just acknowledging about it and to starting dialogue, which is actually the hardest bit. And I think, yeah, films or animation are a great way of initiating that. So by, at this point, Linda, I wanted to ask you, I know that CBC GDF is very active um, in sharing what they do and raising awareness. Um, for example, I follow your organization on Instagram and watch oh. <laughs> and I find your yeah, your videos like very, very interesting because it's like it's teaching about what you do and teaching about different species so it's very interesting content and so i wanted to ask about more uh, a bit more about what are the main channels that cbc gdf uses to create um dialogue and like to spread awareness about their work uh, uh pardon me you mean uh channel? yeah channel, channels so which uh, you, you use, of course, social media, both in China and um, in the West, but mm -hmm. also other channels. What are the most important ways of communicating that you use? Yeah, uh, social media is an uh, important part. And uh, we have established a CBC GDF uh, media metrics. And uh, if you search on Baidu.com, and you will find a lot of uh, uh, awareness promotion by our platform. And uh, the average, uh, the average clicks, uh, I think, uh, uh, the latest data I received from uh, my colleague is that uh, uh, the CBC GDF media receives about uh, 30 million viewings per day. So uh, it uh, delivered a lot of 
the uh, environmental message to uh, general public. And uh, uh, we are mainly a platform. The materials uh, is mainly from the general public. Like uh, we have uh, uh, tens of thousands of um, volunteers around China. And uh, we have established uh, more, uh, about 200 community conservation areas. And uh, every day they, they give us a lot of messages and uh, we organize and we uh, we make the uh, we make the environmental uh, awareness promotion products so um, for uh, and another part is of, uh, about a young generation as you just uh, as you uh, just mentioned uh, it is very important to uh, bridge the gap uh, and deliver the message in a way that they like. And we have supported uh, uh, about uh, dozens of green schools, which uh, we help them to, uh, we advise them to carry out uh, enviro enviro environment um, classes uh, or so, and uh, outdoor activities and uh, they uh, enjoy that very much. Generally, uh, we believe it is very important to do mass communication and uh, um, we need to go beyond the uh, boundaries and we needed to find, uh, how do I say, communication um, outside of the box. For example, uh, the environmental message it is very easy to just be limited in the environment protection circle. But, uh, uh, you know, China is uh, now is in a very, very good uh, uh, time. We, we are in a very good time the, that China advocates the ecological civilization. And uh, uh, this is the best time and uh, we have very good opportunity. Uh, what we needed to do is to work hard to mobilize all stakeholders' participation. And that's why we always try to uh, go uh, to mobilize all stakeholders. Like uh, last week, we organized, uh, we collaborated with uh, the EH, uh, ETH Ethereum Foundation, and uh, uh, we have uh, carried out a, a, a webinar on Web3 develop. Uh, deliver, uh, developers and we want uh, those developers to uh, actively participate in uh, environmental protection because they are they are very experienced in the, te the technology but uh, they may not know very much about biodiversity conservation or no so this kind of uh, uh, awareness uh, promotion and uh, uh, could be very very useful uh, so uh, that's all for now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. I think yeah, it's very important to to involve people, not only people who are specifically interested in uh, environmental sustainability, but to involve different stakeholders. And yeah, I think um, also one really important aspect is that the environmental sustainability really has no geography. So one thing that I found really important about, like really interesting about um, Obki actually, is that um, when you watch it, you can't really tell where it's from. Uh, and I think I mentioned this to you when we met, you can't really tell where it's from because of course, I think the trope of the alien is really clever for that to, to make it gl very global. Uh, and I think it could be, um, it could be, showed any, anywhere and it could be of interest anywhere. Um, yeah, so I was thinking, I was wondering if you chose this alien trope to make it global and if this was like in your, uh, in your plans already when you, when you wrote it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We we're trying to make it as global as possible. Obviously, it's a bit harder with things like fruits when we talk about local fruit picking. <laughs> uh, some people pick mangoes that you know uh, grow around the corner. We pick apples. So obviously, apple was a bit more uh, northern fruit, I guess. Uh, but uh, genuinely, we're trying to avoid yeah any uh, to show that Opki is based somewhere particular because we want to make sure 
is more international, so people from all over the world can relate to Opke and relate to the problems that he's talking about. And obviously we covered uh, problems like coral reefs, uh, as well as uh, things more like yeah, local produce and things like this. Um, and um, yeah, so it was definitely one of the main things. It's kind of, in animation, generally, you want it to, and it also doesn't have much dialogue. And uh, so it's very easy to dub in other languages. And we use lots of uh, motion graphics to explain the messages as well. So it's accessible for a bit younger audience as well. And so it's a bit more visual. So it's not just saying things out loud, it's also showing things happening on the screen. So younger kids can understand it without even knowing exactly what carbon means and things like this. It's generally aimed at six plus but it's quite fluid in terms of that, obviously, hopefully family viewing is uh, also happening and uh, younger kids in, in, in the household also can watch it and get something out of it as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think this global feature of films and animations about the environment is very important and also as an opportunity for the industry to focus on such a topic. Also, um, Ida Maria, I think your, your film, Summer of Bees, is also an example of that because, yeah, of course, it's from Finland, but it traveled so many countries and it was shown in so many festivals that, in, and it's really relatable everywhere. And it won international awards and it's shortlisted for the BAFTA Students Awards. So it's really a great su success and it's a great opportunity to have these kind of successes. Um, I know also my octopus teacher was was one of the winners of the Global Sustainability Film Awards by TV. So I wanted to ask um, Karma how, so that film is from South Africa uh, and it became as well a global one. It became a global story. So I wanted to ask, um, do you think it's easy or hard for a film on global sustainability to become global, really? And what, what, is, what does it take for it to become global? I think it's very hard. You know, um, even, even now, you know, if, you, if you are making any content around environmental issues or you know, on sustainability issues, it's very hard. You know? I think the only one of the biggest reasons for the success of Octopus, my teacher, was that it was a human story, you know. So I think, uh, you know, because when we when we first saw the film, this was before BAFTA, uh, which was normally BAFTA and Oscar and everything else. When we first saw the film, this was way back in early, you know, 20, uh, early 2000, um, um, yeah, around just when it was released by Netflix. When we first saw the film, we saw that this is a this is a topic where they are talking a lot about the biodiversity loss in the oceans through a very very human story. And that worked with us, you know, and then that's how we, you know, made sure that, that the film was nominated for our, for our awards and then it won one of our awards and then it went to BAFTA and then the Oscars. But any stories that you see is that, you know, if you look at even now, even if you look at um, television content, it's very, very hard for any story to have a global outlook straight away. Unless, of course, there is a human element to it. And I think, you know, Evgenia and Ida will also might concur with this is that, Unless and un until you have you bring in this human element, you bring in a personal element to any story being a larger context, it's very difficult otherwise. So some of the success stories that you see in, within the sustainable debate, you know, uh, in terms of the films, could be it could be in fiction, non-fiction. There has to be a human element. There has to be a personal side to it, and that's why I think you know what what Evgenia is doing with her or key. That will, you know, that will straight away link to young people, you know, because there are you're bringing these the the issues right down to your doorstep, right down to your personal issues, and until until unless that does not happen, it will be very very difficult for any content to you know be recognized. Yeah, that's. I think it's really important what you said about the need for a human element, and maybe. Even sometimes, I think for animation, it's a bit different, but for films, having actually a geogra geographic identity, it is important. It's, it's not that to make a film global, we have to eliminate that. So I think it's important to have this identity and to show that this, no matter where this is made from, no matter where the, the context is, we all share the same problem. We all share the same situation. 
So having a global approach maybe yes. um, even helps that. So Linda, yeah. I wanted to ask your opinion on, on this, because of course, as you mentioned, and as we know Ch um, in China right now, sus global sustainability is one of the most important priorities. And there is this goal to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. And also, mm. also it's very advanced and as your organization shows in uh, biodiversity conservation, it's working a lot towards that. Um, and I'm thinking since China's film industry right now is so huge and it's the biggest one in the world, do you think there is a chance that the Chinese film industry will reflect these efforts? Uh, yes, a huge opportunity. And uh, I would say um, many production uh, teams are concerned about that. And over the past years, uh, we have received uh, a lot of uh, uh, consultation requirements and they come to us and they uh, dis uh, discuss with us uh, um, the, the message. If, uh, if the message they want uh, that the want to deliver is correct or so. And I, I would say the um, more and more uh, film um, films are very concerned about, uh, are very care about that. So uh, it is very optimistic. And uh, another trend is that, um, you know, <laughs> due to the social media like TikTok or so, uh, people get used to uh, watch shorter, uh, videos or so. So uh, as uh, what uh, uh, the other two keynote speakers say uh, have have mentioned, uh, I, I would suggest. Uh, I, I would say in the future, uh, it the sh sh short film has a, a very good opportunity in current times because of people's um, attention seems to get uh, shorter and the more so so uh, those uh, short uh, animations or films can be very influential if the contents can uh, deliver the um, very essence message in a very limited time so I, would, uh, I believe that would be great Another thing is that um, uh, from the audience side, um, we have noticed uh, many Chinese audience uh, care about um, ethics. Say uh, over the past years, so I, as I remembered, we have uh, uh, received uh, uh, public uh, public um, calls uh, from uh, from people that uh, they worried about some movie. Are you uh, the the, the uh, film if uh, they have abused the, the animal involved so they care about that and mm -hmm. as you can see now more and more uh, film production uh, will use ethic uh, declaration in the end so you can see that's that's some kind of ecological civilization and the general people are practicing that and it also uh, forced the uh, industry to uh, to do that in a proactive way, uh, that's very good. Mm. Yeah, that's very encouraging to hear. Um, I would like now to open the floor to any questions from the audience, if you have any questions from our panelists. I saw that there was a question in the chat, uh, but to Linda, I don't know if you want to, to answer to that also speaking or you will, it's because I saw you answer that. And uh, that's very short. Uh, yeah, I, I, if I have the opportunity, I would like yes. to say a little bit more. Of course. Uh, we are, uh, over time, we are in the, uh, in the sixth mass extinction time. So um, so we need to, and uh, today we are facing uh, three major crises, including climate and uh, biodiversity loss and uh, public health. As the, today we, we are confined in our homes by the very small uh, box, but um, uh, no single crisis can be handled uh, without uh, do uh, think about other crises. We need some kind of a holistic approach. I will give uh, some example. Uh, thank, thank you so much for Disney's uh, question. Actually, I would like to give you some example. For example, some um, um, if uh, we, we know when we say uh, uh, climate change, people will 
generally think about uh, planting trees, but planting trees need to uh, think about biodiversity conservation. If the trees are, um, are just using one or two species in the large areas, that may not be very good. And if they are planted in the wrong place, like maybe in the, uh, in the wetlands, um, uh, coastal wetlands or so, that may be a kind of a problem for migratory birds. So uh, we needed to handle this, um, this uh, crisis in a holistic way. And uh, I believe everybody can make uh, some uh, contribution and awareness promotion might be the first step, especially as what, uh, uh, what uh, I, um, Evgenia, uh, you just uh, told me about uh, the two minutes uh, animation. Wow, I think that's amazing. I really like it. So it's not just for kids, actually, even as ad adults, well, we like that. We'd like to see that. Thank you, Disney, and thank you. Uh, thank you. I think we might have time for one more question. Uh, if there is any anyone else who wants to ask a question, please raise your hands or just pop it in chat. Um, if not, um, I think we can we can also wrap up. Um, is there another question? No, okay, I don't think there is any more questions. So I would like to thank so much uh, our speakers today and for this insightful and fascinating discussion. Uh, okay, there is, an, there is a question uh, for Linda. Is there a way for CBC GDF to work with international filmmakers? I firmly believe, thank you. Let's explore that. And uh, we are more than happy to uh, work together with, all, with you in the future to see how we can do together to make this a better world for all life. Thank you. I think this, this is, has been a really fascinating discussion and hopefully it sparks um, opportunities for further collaboration. And yeah, once again, I would like to thank you all for, uh, to, uh, for speaking today, for your contribution and your time. And thank you, Odyssey, for giving us a platform for this panel today. Um, so I will now share uh, the, our guest website in the chat so that our, um, the audience can have a look at their amazing projects um, and also I would like to encourage everyone to visit Odyssey's F Film Festival's website, which I will also um, add to the chat to explore the full program, watch the films and subscribe to the, um, to the next panels. Thank you, everyone, and I really hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thanks, Julia. Thanks.